in order to become better writers, what we can do is look at how other good writers establish setting and character, look at what they do, and then we can incorporate some of their processes into our own writing. So that's really our purpose here today, looking at There Was Still Love by Favel Parrott. Uh, it's a great little story. Um, and what we're going to do is just look through some of the aspects that, that are developed. So when we um, look at this story, you'll see it has a really nostalgic tone, very sentimental, it's told from the perspective of the child. And this um, child's very um, respectful of her grandparents. And we learn a lot about their relationship through the simple things that they do and the way that they uh, speak to each other. Um, and so here we have a very ordinary setting. We're just in a household of grandma and grandpa, and they're going through the motions of preparing food and having something to eat. Um, <clears throat> but there's so much revealed in doing that. So when we start, we look at this first sentence, our footsteps echo as we climb the stairs. We gain a lot of... Um, uh, you know, insight there that the reader is invited into the story because of the enigmatic, the mysterious sort of fashion of of that sentence. We want to know who, um, who's there and why are they there and what's happening and what's up, up the stairs, you know, what's the purpose of them going up there. And I think that this word our, this um, pronoun, does include you, the reader, in that as well. So you go on this journey as well. And because the uh, footsteps echo, there's some sort of ominous feeling. There's a large empty space and we're, we're not really sure what what to expect. And I think that's really interesting. Uh, it's a nice way to start a story because um, rather than just coming out with the facts, we're, we've, as the reader, we have to orientate ourselves and try and try and work that out. Now, the setting is established through sensory imagery. So we come down here, we've got the third floor flat, the heavy wooden door, inside the smell of warm pipe tobacco and homemade cakes home. So we've got very um, brief little snippets of information here that tell us so much. They, they don't say a lot, but they tell us a lot because what it does is it, it makes the reader fill in the gaps and make assumptions and draw on their own experiences of, of these type of things, whether it's in real life or in the films we've seen or in the books that we've read. But just this warm pipe to tobacco really connects us to um, that old world and we we'll see that, you know, the European family and the, their elderly. So we, we gain a lot from that. Um, so sometimes less information and less explanation actually leads to more. So here the, the writer is is um, using description, um, simple things, the heavy wooden door. Well, what does that reveal and why has the writer used that? Um, you know, a, a setting is really established nicely through that. Then we come down and um, we have this simple action of taking off the shoes and the coat um, and putting on slippers. So the child's are red, grandma's are blue, and grandpa's are brown. So this can be seen as um, uh, symbolic, you know, that that um, colours being used to symbolise different aspects of their, their personality or their character. So we could say that because the child's are red, that they're vibrant, um, you know, in um, The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy wore red shoes, um, so there's some sort of connection perhaps um, to to that colour and why kids have given those. Um, grand, grandma's blue slippers um, reflect her nurturing sort of character and grandpa's brown slippers are more traditional, um, you know, that's an earthy sort of colour and maybe connects him to the land and the type of work he's done growing up. We, we don't have enough information to reveal that, but we start to see maybe he's a bit more black and white or matter of fact than than, than grandma who sees the world in a bit more colour, and we'll look at that in a little while. There's uh, a lot of minutiae, the, the small, precise details that really reveal 
the protagonist's um, familiarity with the scene. So obviously um, the child spends a lot of time there and is um, very observant. You know, we get we get to um, see inside the the mind of this child, and um, and so little things like that. Um, reveal some nice um, aspects of setting and give us an insight into the character a little bit. When we go on to the second page, we start to see um, a strong use of sensory imagery. So we've got the sweet smell of gas. Mum, my grandma blows out the match, breaks it in half with her finger so you can almost hear the snap. So that nice description there um, just gives that familiarity and puts you in a particular um, point in time and it certainly reminds me of my grandparents who um, you know sort of grew up during or were you know young during the depression and the war war era and so it does connect me to that that memory that I have I don't know about you um, and and then we've got this nice image too of the it's a full match of halves in the um, in the ashtray there. So one half is clean, one half of the match in the ashtray is clean, and the other is black and burn. It's full of that. So we're getting all those nice um, <clears throat> little um, images of of what's going on, but it also reveals all these rituals that happen in the house. So um, you know the cooking, uh, the making of the tea, those type of things. Uh, are very grounding and, and a very familiar scene in that household. We've got the sounds of the toilet flushing, which is the, the signal that grandpa's awake. And, um, and so that's where the action's about to, to, um, to begin. And grandma breaks into this song. And I think that they've chosen like a, a nursery rhyme style song here. And it does many things, sort of indicates um, her connection to times past, you know, the good old days. They create, the song creates a bit of a rhythm and pace and it tells a grandma's love of life. You know, she's she's making a cup of tea and look out because here comes grandpa with his hurt shirt hanging out. So it, it tells her, her fun, um, positive, very sort of happy disposition. Um, despite probably having a, a life of hardship, you know, the, the, these simple things and family is what's really important, and we get that sense from there. The, um, then we have this shift, I've said, going from the ordinary scene, but the making of the tea moves to another plane. So we go from the ordinary to the extraordinary, into the celestial, and it shows that the child is full of advent, um, <clears throat> Um, imagination, full of adventure, she's inventive. Um, and space and Neptune are used to show um, the the um, the way that the child escapes that very mundane, ordinary, probably boring atmosphere, even though she likes it, she likes to break away from it. And so um, she uses her imagination. And you see there's lots of blacks and blues um, you know, lots of colour imagery used. But I think that um, what we should focus on in this little bit is the passing of time through oral or auditory imagery. So there are things like the music, there are chimes going off, the old clock, um, ticking of the Smith's clock. Those things indicate the passing of time. So maybe the afternoon's wearing on and it's starting to get a bit, a bit darker and the dappled light through the lace curtain sort of is an indicator of a visual <clears throat> indicator of time passing. And so that, that could be a motif for the ageing of the parent, the grandparents as well. Um, that's a possibility, but definitely the passing of time. Um, and that brings us, I suppose, into um, <clears throat> the, um, the connection to cultural heritage, and it's really re revealed slowly throughout. So rather than just having one paragraph where everything about grandma and grandpa's cultural heritage is blurted out, little bits are revealed as the story progresses. So earlier on we found out they were from Czechoslovakia, and um, here we've got um, the little affectionate term, Malaliska, um, 
for for her, which you know tells us a lot about the the close connection and relationship that they have. Down the bottom, we've got this um, comment on the the Iron Curtain, and more so, it's the um, the the Gherkins, you know, and they there's um, a fair bit revealed about the Gherkins and that that Grandpa he really loved the Gherkins and they would sit down. I think it's down here. One gherkin for me, one for my grandma, and one for my grandpa. And essentially, that that experience is um, their whole world. It's really what is um, important to them. And so it does um, tell us of of their worldview, and they gain a sense of belonging through sharing simple things. So it's those little rituals, cooking. The, the eating of food that are used to capture their cultural difference and their generational difference, but it really does reveal their um, their enjoyment of simple things in life. Okay, there's a big world outside this apartment, but while they're in this room, um, that is their universe, which is a lovely segue into the next idea, which is of the music um, that occurs around here. So we've had the planet uh, before and and the, the child is in the spaceship going off into space using her imagination. And then music um, is played while Grandpa's smoking his pipe, um, listening to the music. And we've got this um, this album, Pulse the Planet, chosen. And, you know, it's, it's orchestral music and it's obviously deliberately chosen to carry more meaning. So this um, orchestral music was uh, released in 1916 and each suite of music was named after a different planet. So that's a way of, of um, making connections to um, <clears throat> all, all the, the different things going on um, outside the world, but, you know, they, they what they bring into their house um, is is really rich and and vibrant for them. So we could say that it's music, food, language, and those little traditions and little rituals establish who they are. They tell us a lot about their age and their culture. And you know, the gherkin um, is really being used as a motif for belonging, isn't it? The, all those little, um, I suppose it's food. Food is the motif. It's all those little rituals that that um, reveal their sense of belonging, and so I think what this um, writer is able to do is present all these rich ideas um, without telling the reader. So they're just all these ideas are placed out there, and we do the hard work, and we we appreciate and sort of. Um, Look at the use of imagery and and let all those those ideas resonate with us, and we build the picture of the the um, the setting, and we can see how that setting helps reveal a lot about the characters. You'll notice too the the way that the the um, piece of writing is written that we've got long sentences that are you know, descriptive, and then we've got all these little short ones as well. So. They're used purposefully for effect, and I think they do a pretty good job. 